everybody. Um, it's great to be here, and um, uh, thank you to the Bulgarian host for this great venue and hospitality in Sofia, and, uh, and to Gerald Pollock for inviting me to this. Um, so I want to talk about um, radio frequency, electromagnetic water treatment, and an experiment that I did uh, a couple of years ago to try to detect an effect in plants, um, in a plant system. So first of all, I'll discuss an, this experiment that I did. And this is published in the Water Journal. And then I'll go on to uh, the mysterious part of this, which is what is the explanation for this phenomenon? Um, so this radio frequency water treatment has been around since the 1990s. It was quite an intensive effort to investigate it, probably in involving maybe a dozen different groups from around the world, and um, mostly people in colloid research, physical ch chemists, um, and uh, then some. subsequently some of the these researchers developed commercial products. Um, and so, uh, uh, this treatment involves exposing water to radio frequency radiation between about 10 to 50 megahertz, which is about five to 20 meters wavelength. So this is very, very tiny energy. You know, this is about one ten millionth of the energy of visible light. Um, and it's applied in high amplitude pulses. So this is an important feature of it, that um, you're not gonna get this effect just from your AM radio set. Um, and with these commercial devices, it's applied for very short periods of you know, maybe 10 to 20 seconds, or as water flows through a pipe in, in large commercial systems, it's applied as the water's flowing. So it only, it's only applied for a few seconds. Um, and so these colloid researchers investigated a lot of microphysical changes in the water and, and discovered uh, a, a lot of anomalies that really puzzled them. And that in fact, they called this the uh, magnetic water memory anomaly. So that it's good. There's a lot of so there's a lot of published papers on this, um, and also you know uh, uh, schematics of the of the devices to apply the radiation and so forth. So so that's that's good. Um, then on the other hand, this treated water is claimed to have large benefits for plant growth and also health benefits for humans and animals. And uh, it's also actually widely used in industry for scale reduction and for uh, concrete production for hydrating cement. Um, and so this has been used for over 20 years now. And I became particularly interested in the application to plants and these claims that the, the treated water can increase growth rates in plants by, you know, 20 to 40 percent. But there's a bit of a problem that there's almost no published uh, research on this aspect of it. So just flick over to this by Aqua Plant Mate. This was the, the product that I used in my experiment to apply the radiation. Um, so this is just a little handheld device with an antenna. You put it into a bucket of water and press the button for 15 seconds, and the water becomes charged. So people refer to it as charged water. So this is the, the smallest device they make for just for home gardeners. They have other commercial devices. And there's actually now quite a number of companies that, you, that produce devices for this same kind of technology. Um, And it's, it's claimed to retain this property for, you know, at least one or two days. 
Now, of course, this is uh, controversial. There's lots of debunker attacks. Um, but more seriously, you know, probably most academic chemists or physicists will tell you that these effects are impossible. And it's understandable why, I mean. You know, this is sort of equivalent to shining a little flashlight into a bucket of water for, for 10 seconds and expecting to have a result. Um, however, um, you know, there's lots of gardeners and horticulturalists and farmers and people who actually use it to grow plants all report strong beneficial effects. And... Um, you know, there's actually a lot of recorded evidence for these benefits in terms of field trials by, from private companies and uh, some controlled experiments. Um, and I've, uh, you know, I've managed to get a collection of quite a few dozen of these, but it, they're quite inaccessible and they're not published in scientific journals. So unless you've got a lot of time to chase around and find them, it's uh, difficult to find information. And there seem to be almost no studies at all by scientific institutions testing this. Um, so, you know, you've got to wonder really what's going on here because you've got thousands of commercial users over 20 years who are, who are really convinced it works and a lot of real evidence, even though it's not in the scientific literature. And it's potentially a major technology for food production. But it's, you know, it's completely shunned by the, sci by the conventional scientific world. And because the subject's so polarized, it's difficult to get any kind of balanced information or actually know what to believe about it. And when I first saw it, you know, I didn't know what to think, really. I, I became convinced there must be something to it. And actually, Jerry, Jerry Pollock's uh, book persuaded, persuaded me a lot that, you know, there, there can be something to these things. So, uh, so I decided to do my own experiment to see if I could produce an effect for myself. So this is what I call the dandelion experiment. So here we have... First of all, I'll, I'll show you this. Now, just wonder if anybody knows what this is. A sunflower, yes, it's a sunflower, but anything else? Hmm? A, sorry? Plastic, yes. It can be a lot of different things at once. But, um, but actually, the answer I'm looking for is that it's a scientific measuring, measurement device. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, a lot of scientists have to use these crude electronic devices like, like elec uh, you know, um, electron microscopes and things, which are very difficult to make and, and so forth. But, Fortunately for me, nature designed the perfect measurement device for me to use, which grows wild in the fields. So, <laughs> heliotrope. Okay. Yes. So, and actually, this is a perfect measuring device for what I want to measure. And uh, I think it's also it's important to realise that this that what we're measuring are properties of the water, right? So we're not trying to measure properties of this plant. We're using the plant in the water to measure the properties of the water. And um, so here I, I just illustrate the basic concept. This is a simple concept that, you know, you, you go and pick a whole bunch of um, scientific measurement devices from the fields and sp split them into two samples and put one sample in uh, treated water and one sample in untreated water. And what happens, of course, is when you pick a flower, um, the stem wilts and it becomes flaccid as it dehydrates and the cells lose tergal pressure. Um, and then you put it back in water and, the, and the, um, generally the stem will come back up again to the horizontal. So 
for the uh, for the main measurement, I measured the times of the two samples, so the times for the for the um, for the stem to revive. So I made holders and held them at 20 degrees, and I recorded them as being revived when the stem became horizontal. Yeah. So it's a nice, simple, um, conceptually simple experiment. And the numbers I've put on here just represent the typical kind of scale of effects that I found that you can say um, that if treated stems, if a sample of treated stems took 45 minutes, the non-treated stems under ideal, this is under optimized conditions, would take about 60 minutes. Um, there's no actual average time because it depends how long you've wilted the stems and if you wilt them severely, they take longer to come up. But this is, a, this is about the, the magnitude of effect. Uh, you know, this is a, a very large magnitude. And uh, actually, there's a second measurement you can make, which is revival rate. So not all stems are going to revive. Some stems never come back up or don't come back up in the time. Um, and so also, treated water had a, had a higher revival rate. So maybe if 20% failed of a sample, 30% of un the untreated stems would water and untreated stems and untreated water would fail. So, so actually, I got these two very strong effects. Um, and just to illustrate in some more detail here, these are, this is a graph of individual stems from one, um, from one large sample, which is a combination of multiple smaller replicate samples. I would normally test about 28 pairs at a time. Um, and you can, well, you can see the, um, each bar here is an individual flower. And the red, the red bars are the untreated flowers and the, the blue bars are the treated flowers. So this is like maybe getting two groups of people of different heights and getting them to, to line up and ordering them by height. And you would see the, the taller group, the, their heights would go up above the shorter group, right? So this actually illustrates you know, quite clearly how strong this effect is. And the tails at the end, the gaps between the end of the graphs are the, the um, stems that fail to revive. So you see the untreated water has got more stems that fail to revive. Um, and it's also uh, connected to wilting severity. The more severely you wilt the flowers, the stronger this effect is. So with a very severely wilted sample, you know, I found uh, um, I found an increase in revival speed of 32%, down to maybe 20% for um, lightly wilted flowers. And the statistical significance for these effects is, is extremely high. You know, there's no, really no doubt about it. So. The interpretation of this is, I call this a water transport effect, that water transport in plants is enhanced by this radio frequency treatment. Um, so the, the, the revival depends on the plant um, rehydrating, which is uh, drawing water up, up the stem by capillary action and into the into the cells by osmosis, or being pushed into the cells by osmosis in uh, Jury's theory. Um, and this is a physical process. It's uh, driven by osmosis and capillary action. It's not chemical or metabolic. So, so we can interpret this as being a direct effect on, on physical water transport. Now, um, when I started, I just wanted to you know, confirm there's some effect. And then I've, I started, uh, I, I had to um, uh, look at different variations of conditions and I looked for optimal conditions to produce an effect. Um, 
because just, just showing there is an effect, actually, is a, is a, a major thing that, that shows that these debunkers are wrong, you know. Um, but, you know, I looked at, there really turned out to be three basic clues or th and three basic conditions for this process. Um, and these, these are questions. Does the radio frequency treatment affect water properties or properties of the plant material or both together? So I call this treatment target variations. Does, does it require impurities in the water to interact with? And so I tried different varieties here, one with, one with um, clean water, one with salted water, and one with what I call grit water, which is water with a spoon of some kind of uh, sandy clay earth added, which, which provides lots of minerals and colloids and particles and, and ions and things. And the third main variation is, uh, does the treatment require time for the effect to develop? Does it happen immediately you, you apply it, or, or does it take time for the water to develop the property? So the treatment target so basically, you can treat the stems and water together, or you can treat the water and then put the stems in, or you can treat stems and then put them into untreated water. So, um, uh, so it's actually only when you treat stems and water together that you get this very strong effect. Um, and when you treat the stem by itself and put it in water, I could find no effect. Treating the water actually does have effects, but more subtle. So I think this shows that really the, the effect is on water properties. Now, water impurities were very important. Um, I didn't actually find any effect using pure water. Um, it doesn't mean there isn't an effect, it just means it didn't develop in the time uh, in the time that I, I observed it. Um, using salt, sodium chloride, um, gave weaker effects of maybe about 12% uh, increase in speed. And it was really this grit solution that gave this strong effect of, uh, uh, you know, a major increase in water transport. Um, And the, the time factor is that the, the um, treatment seemed to take effect after about 20 minutes. So before that, I couldn't find any difference in revival speeds. So it seems like it doesn't happen immediately that you apply the radiation. It's something that hap develops dynamically in the water following the application. Um, so, uh, so actually, I, I did lots of different variations of these experiments. I'll just flick through some of these. I won't try to explain them, but, you know, there's, once you've got a few uh, measurement variables, you, you end up with lots of, uh, lots of different factors to compare. Um, so I'll just summarize here the, the end of this experiment that, that there is a, a, an effect on water transport. And um, this is a process of capillary action and osmosis, and it's physically driven by, by e electromagnetic forces. Okay, so now we turn to what's the, what's the explanation? Um, you know, orthodox water science just ignores this whole thing. In fact, it's, it, it says that it's impossible, and it you know, gives a couple of theoretical reasons that we'll have a look at, but uh, what I'll argue is that easy theory really is the critical ingredient to explain this process. Um, it hasn't been applied to this phenomena in specific detail, um, but I'll just start with a quick look at some of this early research in the 1990s, because this is actually extensive research that seems to have been forgotten. And these people discovered a lot of detail about the, the microprocesses. Um, so it originated from research on colloids, 
Um, these are just three of three key groups of primary researchers, and um, Pollock and Morse were American researchers, and they developed the Viaqua products in Ireland. That's, this is a product that I used. And there's, well, actually, more, there's more than 50, you know, um, um, primary research papers on this. Um, what did I? Yeah, so, so they looked at uh, questions like, what's the locus of the interaction? What's the importance of the frequency, the amplitude, effects on physical, microphysical product uh, properties, conductivity, pH, surface tension, and so forth, and time dependence. Um, and they found uh, various answers to these, um, including the, that it requires microbubbles. They propose that the interaction is a perturbation of bubble water interface, breaks up H-bonded water networks, and so forth. Um, and uh, this became referred to as magnetic water memory. For example, Colic and Morse say the Magnetic, in 1997, the magnetic water memory effect is probably one of the most challenging problems of modern physical chemistry. The existence of the magnetic memory of water was a rather anecdotal phenomenon until recently when the members of several laboratories reported sophisticated physico-chemical measurements which quantified this process. And, and this is kind of reminiscent of uh, Jacques Benavist's uh, concept of water memory, but it's it's different, of course. They are just talking about the, th the idea that electromagnetic interactions leave a signature, a physical signature in the water, in the water properties. But this line of research just seemed to come to a grinding halt after, the, after about 2000 and, um, and just left the whole subject in a, in a state of mystery over what the fundamental interactions are. And, um, and actually it seems quite rare to find references to this research. For example, in um, Jerry's book, The, F the uh, Fourth Phase of Water, I, 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 looked at, I looked up about 60 researchers who have published these papers in the 1990s, and I couldn't actually find a reference to a single paper. <laughs> and, and of course, it's not... Jerry's book is not supposed to be a comprehensive uh, uh, account of all this, but it's just that this seems to be a line of research that's just uh, gone like the Neanderthals and been ignored. So, I don't know. I, I think there's some really interesting work that these people did, but the problem was, really, I think, that they couldn't explain these phenomena because they weren't aware of easy processes. You know, they failed to, well, actually, they, they identified what you would say are easy phenomenon. I should say they failed to identify uh, easy structures that I think we now know are central to these mechanisms. And they also failed to determine micro effects on biological systems. So there's a big lack of publications about this. And, um, and so we have these questions... Um, you know, wh actually, what is the effect of this radio frequency treatment on exclusion zones? What kind of zones are formed? And I think we have to understand this dimension. So I'll just now quickly put this into a, a kind of broader explanatory scheme. We have three, sta three stages here. We have a radio frequency interaction, then some water property develops, and then we have... Um, Water processes are affected, as in the, the, this water property affects osmosis and capillarity. And we've got two big questions, really. Where does the energy come from to power this, and what kind of water property is created? And these relate to two objections by skeptics. The, the, the first big objection that you always hear is water can't carry any structural properties to, required to produce such effects. And the second one is this radio frequency radiation is just too low energy to cause effects. And these are taken as just conclusive theoretical objections by, by a lot of 
uh, scientists, but they're both wrong. We, you know, now we know that water develops easy structures, and the radio frequency radiation is, doesn't necessarily have to provide the energy. There are lots of other energy source, sources available, and I think um, I think the, this radio frequency radiation must catalyze an absorption of radiation, probably from infrared radiation, to build the easy structures. So the first point about structures, of course, we everybody in this room knows this, that, um, that water takes on these long-lasting structures. And actually, this theory is ideal, really, to explain the phenomena of enhanced water transport, as long as we can confirm that the radio frequency treatment actually causes a formation of easy structures. And the second point about energy is that, of course, easy structures take energy to build, and the energy provided by the radio frequency treatment is not enough, you know, uh, it's nowhere near enough. It's, it's tiny compared with just normal uh, thermal energy exchanges. Um, and we know that infrared radiation is the the normal energy source for building easy layers. So this is actually taken from pre uh, Jerry's presentation in 2013, showing you know this idea of infrared absorption. Um, so the conclusion I've come to is that um, is that this radio frequency treatment must catalyze a reaction, so that the easy structures build over 20 minutes or so after you've switched it off. And, um, and we, I think the development of these structures are typically catalyzed at hydrophilic interfaces as self-assembling structures. And this idea of this catalyzed re um, reaction is quite consistent with normal physics. There's nothing in physics or thermodynamics to rule this out because if the system was in a, a th thermodynamic equilibrium, it would be unlikely, but in fact, it's in a far from equilibrium state. You know, our environment isn't equilibrium and, um, and we have uh, the typical processes we have as in, uh, you know, Prigogine's phrase, order out of chaos, is that in far from equilibrium thermophysics, the thermodynamic flow actually creates ordered structures as it goes. And, and I think actually this is the, perhaps the interesting point. If we could look carefully at, you know, what process is going on after you apply this radiation, and how, does, how can it really catalyze these structures to start self-assembling? I think that is, to me, a really interesting uh, connection with, with thermodynamics. So in summary, I'll say that um, you know, these radio frequency water treatments do have real effects, including enhanced water transport, and this can actually have a big benefit in agriculture and horticulture that uh, water transport is propagated in organic systems through easy structures and processes. So this is con continuous with this general easy theory. And, but the, the, the radio frequency interaction is not understood in conventional science in any, in any fundamental way. And it's still open in this new easy science. So I think it would be very interesting to see some further studies to find mechanisms by which uh, this absorption of infrared radiation can be catalyzed in this way. So, thank you very much.